For a very long time, DC Comics had the movie theaters and television screens to themselves. The main reason is that DC characters lend themselves fairly easily to being transformed into live-action characters without the use of computer-generated graphics, whereas their counterparts over at Marvel do not. Slap a red cape and some blue tights on a decently fit guy and throw him in a Peter Pan flying rig and he is Superman. Put a decently fit guy in some gray tights and a black cape and cowl and you have Batman. Get a good looking woman, a golden lasso, some blue panties and a red, white and blue corset and you have Wonder Woman. But how do you do the Fantastic Four without CGI? Or the X-Men? or most of the Avengers. There is a reason the first real Marvel television or movie characters to hit the small and big screens were Captain America, Spider-Man, and Hulk, and the latter of those badly. There is a reason all Marvel movies sucked well into the 1990s, while DC was doing television and movies as far back as 1951's Superman and the Mole Men which served as a pilot to the 1951 television series Adventures of Superman. Superman and the Mole Men had an interesting story about Clark and Lois going to the small town of Silsby to report on the world's deepest oil well. When they get there, they discover problems. The first is that an elderly night watchman was scared to death. Then the foreman of the site admits that they shut down because they thought they hit radium rather than oil because the core samples they took glowed. Eventually, two mole men come out of the wellhead to explore the town. The residents are terrified because anything touched by the mole men glows due to phosphorescence. A mob soon forms with the intent to kill the monsters. Superman saves one of the quote-unquote monsters when it is thrown from a dam after being shot. The other slithers back into the wellhead. Superman takes the mole man to the hospital for surgery, but the mob soon surrounds the hospital, demanding the creature. Superman disarms the crowd before they can do more damage. Around this time, more mole men emerge, this time armed with strange weapons. The idiot leading the mob decides to go after them himself. Superman winds up saving the idiot and then bringing the injured creature to the mole men. They soon disappear back into the wellhead, destroying the shaft behind them. The show The Movie Spawned ran for six seasons and 108 episodes, spanning the time between black and white television and the era of colorization. For the show, that started in 1955 and includes the last four seasons of the George Reeves-led show. The episodes that were colored were characterized by less violence, most of it being aimed at Superman, and more exaggerated villains, but hardly any of those coming from the comics. They got back to a more serious type of story for the last season, but most shows still followed the formula of either Lois or Jimmy being kidnapped and having Superman rescue them near the end of the episode. More science fiction crept into the stories of the last season as well. While the show looks a little simple by today's standards, the effects to have Superman fly were pretty state-of-the-art for the 1950s, and it marked the first time DC comic characters would appear on film, for the small and big screens. The next time would be 1966, when Batman donned the cowl for the cameras for the first time. The campy Batman television show came first at the beginning of 1966, with its related movie coming in July of that year. With Adam West as Batman slash Bruce Wayne and Burt Ward as Robin slash Dick Grayson, the two were depicted as the Guardians of Gotham as they collaborated with Commissioner Gordon in fighting the criminals of the city. Frequent villains included the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, Catwoman, and King Tut. The 1966 movie had most of the cast of the TV show, with the exception of Julie Newmar's excellent Catwoman, who was replaced by Lee Merriweather. The movie was released shortly after the last episode of the first season aired, and involved a plot that had the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, and Catwoman using an invention of the owner of Big Ben Distillery that could turn humans into dust. They used the dehydrator to turn the United World Organization's Security Council to dust in order to kidnap them. 
Catwoman is also, quote-unquote, taken in her guise as a reporter. The villains flee in a submarine, but are stopped by a bat gadget, forcing the sub to surface. A fight ensues, and the dynamic duo win, discovering Bruce's love interest is, in fact, Catwoman. The council members are scattered in their dust form when the captive inventor sneezes, but Batman invents a machine that separates them and rehydrates them. Alas, they wind up coming back to themselves, speaking the language of a country other than their own. Batman quips that perhaps this mixing of minds will do more good than harm before they exit via the window. It, like the television show, was a campy movie that did little justice to the comic books. However, it was popular enough to drive Batman the series for three seasons and 120 episodes. Keep in mind, those episodes were only a half hour long, shorter with commercials. But the movie and the show were entertaining, as long as you were not looking for seriousness or comic book accuracy. DC would not reappear in either movies or television until the 1974 series Shazam. It was also a half-hour show that only ran for three seasons, this time for 28 episodes, and starred Michael Gray as Billy Batson. The short-lived series showed Billy Batson being helped by the mentor as he learns what it means to be chosen by the wizard Shazam. The show also introduces Isis in 1975, played by Joanna Cameron, who would get her own spin-off show originally called Isis, but later rebroadcast as The Secrets of Isis. It only ran for two seasons and 22 half-hour episodes. Isis had an amulet that gave her the power of animals and the elements given by the Egyptian god Isis to whoever wears the amulet. Isis's alter ego was Andrea Thomas, a high school science teacher who found the amulet on an archaeological dig in Egypt. The show mainly depicted Thomas turning into Isis to save kids in the school from the consequences of their bad choices. Occasionally, the show branched out to include bigger stories of crime or espionage. The show was different in that Isis slash Andrea Thomas would break the fourth wall to acknowledge the audience with a wink or other such gesture and the episodes would end with her imparting the lesson of the show to the audience. The latter of those were taken out of the episodes for syndication. Also in 1974 was the TV movie Wonder Woman. While most would not recognize it as such, the Wonder Woman TV movie of spring 1974 resembled less the Amazonian origin of the character and more the I Ching period of the comic book run. Wonder Woman was portrayed by Kathy Lee Crosby as a super spy rather than a superhero and had no real superpowers. She did not wear the traditional Wonder Woman costume, but instead wore a red, white, and blue uniform composed of leggings and a jacket. Crosby was also a blonde rather than the traditional black-haired character. While the movie rated fairly enough at the time, It was not what the ABC network was looking for, and so they went back to the drawing board with the character. The final entry in the early iterations of Hollywood's attempts to adapt DC into live action was the 1975 Wonder Woman show, starring Linda Carter, the second attempt with the character. Kathy Lee Crosby would later attest that she was offered the role and turned them down. The show ran for three seasons and 60 hour-long episodes. The premise was that Steve Trevor, played by Lyle Wagner, bailed out over the Bermuda Triangle during World War II and discovered Paradise Island, the home of the immortal and beautiful Amazons. Diana rescues Trevor, who wound up unconscious. She nurses him back to health, and her mother decrees an Olympic-style contest will commence to decide who will take Trevor back to the United States. She bans Diana from the games, and Diana tells her that since she cannot participate, she will go to the opposite side of the island because she does not want to watch. Since the competitors wear masks, she is able to sneak into the games with a mask and a blonde wig, and wins. Diana then flies Steve Trevor back to the United States in an invisible plane. She takes Trevor to the hospital and eventually exposes his secretary as a Nazi spy. Afterward, 
She takes up a new disguise as a Navy yeoman and Steve's new secretary. She uses her Amazonian abilities to fight crime and spies, trying to hurt Steve or her new adopted country. It was a good show that became the gold standard for turning DC characters into live action, and Linda Carter was Wonder Woman for a couple of generations of boys and girls. Her reign as the example for how to do superhero live-action characters, however, did not stand unchallenged for long. That, however, is the topic of the next part of this series of DC Comics on Film. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share, and comment down below. It is all appreciated. Part 2 of this series should be out in a few days. Until then... Tschüss.